Hello everybody and welcome back to the Texas Podcast. I am your host Gabe and today we will be finishing up our story of the Battle and Siege of the Alamo. Now this is the final assault and the final assault commenced on March 6 in the early hours at 5.30 a.m. So let's get right into it. At 5.30 a.m. troops silently advanced. Coase and his men approached the northwest corner of the Alamo while Duque led his men from the northwest towards a repaired breach in the Alamo's north wall. The column commanded by Romero marched towards the east wall and Morales' column aimed for the low parapet by the chapel. The three Texan sentinels stationed outside outside the walls were killed in their sleep, allowing Mexican soldiers to approach undetected within musket range of the walls. At this point, the silence was broken by shouts of Viva Santa Ana and music from the buglers. The noise woke the Texans, most of them non-combatants, gathered in the church for sacristy for safety. Travis rushed to his post, yelling, Come on, boys, the Mexicans are upon us and we'll give them hell. And as he passed a group of Tejanos, he yelled to them, Don't surrender, boys. In the initial moments of the assault, Mexican troops were at a disadvantage. Their column formation allowed only the front rows of soldiers to fire safely. Unaware of the dangers, the untrained recruits in the ranks blindly fired their guns, injuring or killing their own troops in front of them. The tight concentration of troops also offered an excellent target for the Texan artillery. Lacking canister shot, the Texans fired their cannon with any metal they could find, including door hinges, nails, and chopped up horseshoes, essentially turning the cannons into giant shotguns. According to the diary of Jose Enrique de la Peña, a single cannon volley did away with half the company of Chessers from Toluca. Duque fell from his horse after suffering a wound to his thigh and was almost trampled by his own men. General Manuel Castrillon quickly assumed command of Duque's column. Although some in the front of the Mexican ranks wavered, soldiers in the rear pushed them on. As the troops massed against the walls, Texans were forced to lean over the walls to shoot, leaving them exposed to Mexican fire. Travis became one of the first occupiers to die. Shot while firing his shotgun into the soldiers below him through one of the sources that he drew his sword and stabbed a Mexican officer who had stormed the wall before succumbing to his injury. Few of the Mexican ladders reached the walls. The few soldiers who were able to climb the ladders were clicked quick killed or beaten back. As the Texans discharged their previously loaded rifles, they found it increasingly difficult to reload while attempting to keep Mexican soldiers from scaling the walls. Mexican soldiers withdrew and and regrouped, but their second attack was repulsed. Fifteen minutes into the battle, they attacked a third time. During the third strike, Romero's column, aiming for the east wall, was exposed to cannon fire and shifted to the north, mingling the second column. Coast's column, under the fire of the Texans on the west wall, also veered north. When Santa Ana saw the bulk of his army was massed against the north wall, he feared a rout, panicked. He sent the reserves into the same area. The Mexican soldiers closest to the north wall realized that the makeshift wall contained many gaps and toeholds. One of the first to scale the 12-foot wall was General Juan Amador. At his challenge, his men began swarming up the wall. Amador opened the postern into the north wall, allowing Mexican soldiers to pour into the complex. Others climbed through the gun ports in the west wall, which had few occupiers. As the Texan occupiers abandoned the north wall and the northern end of the west wall, Texan gunners at the south end of the mission turned their cannon towards the north and fired into the advancing Mexican soldiers. This left the south end of the mission unprotected. Within minutes, Mexican soldiers had climbed the walls and killed the gunners, gaining control of the Alamo's 18-pounder cannon. By this time, Romero's men had taken the east wall of the compound and were pouring into the cattle pen. As previously planned, most of the Texans fell back to the barracks and the chapel. Holes had been carved into the walls to allow the Texans to fire. Unable to reach the barracks, Texans stationed along the west wall headed for the west of the San Antonio River. When the cavalry charged, the Texans took cover and began firing from a ditch. Sesma was forced to send reinforcements and the Texans were eventually killed. Sesamo reported that this skirmish involved 50 Texans, but Edmondson believed that the number was inflated. The occupiers in the cattle pen retreated into the horse corral. After discharging their weapons, the small band of Texans scrambled over the low wall, circled behind the church, and raced on foot to the east prairie, which appeared empty. As the Mexican cavalry advanced on the group, Almiron Dickinson and his artillery crew turned a cannon around and fired into the cavalry, probably inflicting casualties. Nevertheless, all of the escaping Texans were killed. The last Texan group to remain in the open were Crockett and his men. They were defending the low wall in the front of the church. Unable to reload, they used their rifles as clubs and fought with their knives. After a volley of fire and a wave of Mexican bayonets, the few remaining Texans in the group fell back towards the church. 
Mexican army now controlled all of the outer walls and in the and the interior of the Alamo compound except for the church and rooms along the east and west walls. Mexican soldiers turned their attention to a Texan flag waving from the roof of one of the buildings. Four Mexicans were killed before the flag of Mexico was raised in that location. For the next hour, the Mexican army worked to secure complete control of the Alamo. Many of the remaining occupiers were ensconed in the fortified barracks room. In the confusion, the Texans had neglected to spike their cannon before retreating. Mexican soldiers turned the cannon towards the barracks. As each door was blown off, Mexican soldiers would fire a volley of muskets into the dark room. They would then charge in the rooms and inflict hand-to-hand -hand combat. Too sick to participate in the battle, Bowie likely laid and died in bed. Eyewitnesses to the battle gave conflicting accounts of his death. Some witnesses maintained that they saw several Mexican soldiers enter Bowie's room, bayonet him, and carry him alive from the room. Others claimed that Bowie shot himself or was killed by soldiers while too weak to lift his head. According to historian Wallace Sheraton, the most popular and probably most accurate version is that Bowie died on his cot, back braced against the wall and using his pistols and his famous knife. The last of the Texans to die were the 11 men manning the 12-pounder cannon in the chapel. A shot from the 18-pounder cannon destroyed the barricades at the front of the church, and the Mexican soldiers entered the building after firing an initial musket volley. Dickinson's crew fired the cannon from the apse into the Mexican soldiers at the door. With no time to reload, the Texans, including Dickinson, Gregorio Esparza, and James Bonham, grabbed rifles and fired before being bayoneted to death. Texan Robert Evans, the master of ordnance, had been tasked with keeping the gunpowder from falling into Mexican hands. Wounded, he crawled towards the powder magazine but was killed by a musket ball with his torch only inches from the powder. If he had succeeded, the blast would have destroyed the church and killed the women and children hiding in the sacristy. As soldiers approached the sacristy, one of the young sons of occupier Anthony Wolf stood up to pull a blanket over his shoulders. In the dark, Mexican soldiers mistook him for an adult and killed him. Probably the last Texan to die in battle was Jacob Walker, who attempted to hide behind Susanna Dickinson and was bayoneted in front of the woman. Another Texan, Brigero Guero, also sought refuge in the sacristy. Guero had also deserted from the Mexican army in December 1835, and he was spared after convincing the soldiers he was a Texan prisoner. By 6.30 a.m., the battle for the Alamo was over. Mexican soldiers inspected each corpse, bayoneting any body that moved. Even with all the Texans dead, Mexican soldiers continued to shoot, some killing each other in the confusion. Mexican generals were unable to stop the bloodlust and appealed to Santa Ana for help. Although the general showed himself, the violence continued and the buglers were finally ordered to sound a retreat. For 15 minutes after that, soldiers continued to fire into dead bodies. According to many accounts of the battle, between 5 and 7 Texans surrendered. Incensed that these orders had been ignored, Santa Ana demanded the immediate execution of the survivors. Weeks after the battle, stories circulated that Crockett was among those who surrendered. Ben, a former American slave who cooked for one of Santa Ana's officers, maintained that Crockett's body was found surrounded by no less than 16 Mexican corpses. Historians disagree of which version of Crockett's death is accurate. Santa Ana reportedly told Captain Fernando Riza that the battle was but a small affair. Another officer then remarked that with another such victory as this, we'll go to hell. In, the, in his initial report, Santa Ana claimed that 600 Texans had been killed with only 70 Mexican soldiers killed and 300 wounded. His secretary, Raymond Caro, later reputated that report. Other estimates of the number of Mexican soldiers killed range from 60 to 200, with an additional 250 to 300 wounded. Most Alamo historians place the number of Mexican casualties at 400 to 600. This would represent about one-third of the Mexican soldiers involved in the final assault, which Todish remarks, is a tremendous casualty rate by any standards. Most eyewitnesses counted between 182 to 257 Texans killed. Some historians believe that at least one Texan, Henry Warnell, su successfully escaped from the battle. Warnell died several months later of wounds incurred either during the final battle or during his escape as a courier. Mexican soldiers were buried in the local cemetery, Campo Santo. Shortly after the battle, Colonel Jose Sanchez posted that a monument should be erected to the fallen Mexican soldiers. Coast rejected the idea. The Texan bodies were stacked and burned. The only exception was the body of Gregorio Esparza. His brother Francisco, an officer in Santa Ana's Mexican army, received permission to give Gregorio a proper burial. 
The ashes were left there where they fell until February 1837, when Juan Seguin returned to Bayhart to examine the remains. The simple coffin inscribed with the names Travis, Crockett, and Bowie was filled with ashes from the funeral pyres. According to a March 28, 1837 article in the Telegraph and the Texas Register, Seguin buried the coffin under a peach tree grove. The spot was not marked and cannot now be identified. Seguin later claimed that he had placed the coffin in the front of the altar at the San Fernando Cathedral. In July 1936, a coffin was discovered buried in that location, but according to historian Wallace Cheriton, it is unlikely to actually contain the remains of the Alamo occupiers. Fragments of uniforms were found in the coffin, and it is known that the Alamo occupiers did not wear uniforms. In an attempt to convince other slaves in Texas to support the Mexican government over the Texan rebellion, Santa Ana spared Travis's slave Joe. The day after the battle, he interviewed each non-combatant individually. Impressed with Susanna Dickinson, Santa Ana offered to adopt her infant daughter Angelina and have the child educated in Mexico City. Dickinson refused, refused the offer, which was not extended to Juan Ellsbury, although her son was of similar age. Each woman was given a blanket and two silver pesos. Ellsbury and the other Tejano women were allowed to return to their homes in Bayhawk. Dickinson, her daughter, and Joe were sent to Gonzales, escorted by Ben. They were encouraged to relate the events of the battle and to inform the remainder of the Texan forces that Santa Ana's army was unbeatable. During the siege, newly elected delegates from across Texas met at the Convention of 1836. On March 2nd, the delegates declared independence, forming the Republic of Texas. Four days after the fall of the Alamo, the delegates at the Convention received the dispatch Travis had written on March 3rd, warning of his dire situation. Unaware that the Alamo had fallen, Robert Porter called for the Convention to adjourn and march immediately to relieve the Alamo. Sam Houston convinced the delegates to remain in Washington on the Brazos to develop a constitution. After being appointed sole commander of all Texan troops, Houston journeyed to Gonzales to take command of the 400 volunteers who were still waiting for Fannin to lead them to the Alamo. Within hours of Houston's arrival on March 11th, Andres Barcenas and Alcimo Begaros arrived with news that the Alamo had fallen and all Texans were slain. Hoping to halt a panic, Houston arrested the men as enemy spies. They were released hours later when Susana Dickinson and Joe reached Gonzales and confirmed the report. Realizing that the Mexican army would soon advance towards the Texan settlements, Houston advised all civilians in the area to evacuate and ordered his new army to retreat. This sparked a mass exodus known as the Runaway Scrape, and most Texans, including members of the new government, fled east. Despite their losses at the Alamo, the Mexican army in Texas still outnumbered the Texan army by almost 6 to 1. Santa Ana assumed that knowledge of the disparity in troop numbers and the fate of the Texan soldiers at the Alamo would quell the resistance, and that Texan soldiers would click, quickly leave the territory. News of the Alamo's fall had the opposite effect. The men flocked to join Houston's army. The New York Post editorialized that had Santa Ana treated the vanquished with moderation and generosity, it would have been difficult, if not impossible, to awaken that general sympathy for the people of Texas, which now impels so many adventurous and ardent spirits to throng to the aid of their brethren. On the afternoon of April 21st, the Texan army attacked Santa Ana's camp near Lynchburg Ferry. The Mexican army was taken by surprise, and the Battle of San Jacinto was essentially over after 18 minutes. During the fighting, many of the Texan soldiers repeatedly cried, Remember the Alamo, as they slaughtered fleeing Mexican troops. Santa Ana was captured the following day and reportedly told Houston that men may consider himself born to no common destiny who has conquered the Napoleon of the West, and now it remains for him to be generous to be vanquished. Houston replied, you should have remembered that at the Alamo. Santa Ana's life was spared and he was forced to order his troops out of Texas, ending Mexican control of the province and bestowing some legitimacy on the new republic. I want to thank you all for watching. I'll see you on it.